So I want to welcome everybody. Thank you uh, for coming. It's our 23rd webinar, which is kind of hard for me to believe. Um, I also want to sort of uh, have, have a little um, apology or whatever in the beginning. There's a few folks that I see here, like Scott Mills, for example, who have entire careers uh, of experience about change management and implementation planning that don't even touch uh, my own expertise. And as you'll see, I'm going to be referring a little bit to some of the um, kind of popular change management models out there. And I may have some things wrong about it, and I'll be fairly superficial in my comments about it, but I'm trying to contrast certain features of a lot of the good approaches out there to change management to what we try to do. So um, before I go uh, any further into that, however, uh, let me mention I'm really excited about uh, next month's webinar. Um, my two colleagues, my, my brothers in crime, whatever, uh, John Skank and Shane Isley, each of whom I have known for a really long time. When I first met John, he was uh, senior vice president of sales at Dun & Bradstreet, major company, and uh, had that level of executive experience as a sales manager, as a as a operational business manager and leader. And Shane, who has owned applied behavior analysis, behavioral health companies, and implemented accomplishment-based coaching in those companies, and also teaches folks in the behavioral health, applied behavior analysis um, market or industry, how to apply and how to do accomplishment-based coaching. Uh, the three of us are going to get together for a conversation because we've all been involved in the development, delivery, and application of coaching, in particular, our performance thinking coach model and program. In fact, Shane and John co-facilitated the program at our most recent Summer Institute in June. So I think we're going to have a pretty robust conversation about what it is about this coaching approach and particularly accomplishment-based coaching uh, that is quite different from the other coaching models and methods that we've seen out there. Um, so anyway, that's going to be October 26th. And as, as ever, you can register for it if you aren't already signed up to sort of be permanently on our list uh, on our web page at performancethinking.com. So let's talk about the agenda a little bit. I want to, there's a lot to say in an hour, plus or minus, but I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> at least how I imagine change management implementation planning to be. What is it, basically? And then very briefly talk about a few of the popular methodologies and identify some of the features of those methodologies that in some respects I think are lacking. And then I want to talk a little bit about what's come to be called the three buckets approach, which is our particular approach that's accomplishment based and systemic. And it's an outgrowth of our performance improvement methodology called performance thinking that many of you know about. And uh, then how do we apply that logic that is, that is a part of our general performance improvement methodology, but how do we apply it in the context of um, implementation planning, change management, how leaders and managers and sometimes other people who are defined as, uh, in some methodologies as agents, change agents or champions uh, can make a big difference, but especially people who are managing and leading others. We can talk a little bit about sustainment because that's one of the things I think that is often missed and just thrown into the bucket of reinforcement for a lot of change management uh, methodologies. And then hopefully uh, have a little bit of time for discussion and Q&A using the chat box. So, you know, the first what, what a question to ask is what is implementation or change management? Because I will confess, I've told some of the folks in this group, I think, uh, who are my friends and colleagues, that, um, you know, my first contact with this, uh, with performance improvement back in the early 1980s, when I was trying to roll out programs in sales organizations out in the field, where we had very little control over folks when they were not in the room during training sessions. Uh, how are we going to get them to practice and monitor their own performance and get better without anybody being sort of there to, to tell them to do it? And so my first contact with Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model was really about implementation planning because we realized we could have the best darn training and learning tools in the world. But if we didn't arrange other conditions to be sure there was uptake and application, we wouldn't get results. And in fact, we learned and published some articles during that period that we could get dramatic results. We could have uh, new salespeople uh, described by veterans as knowing more than they did, uh, you know, after a few weeks of training and then applying it in the field. And those results would have happened without what I was doing. And so what I think 
the way I think about implementation and change management is very simple. You've designed something. It might be in our case, as in our case, was a self-managed learning program, or it might be a new system of some kind, or it might be a strategy that you want to execute or a strategic plan that you want to execute, maybe a process that's a new way of doing stuff or some initiative. And so you've, you've built it. So now what? The thing is designed. Now what? How are you going to roll it out? And so what we would say is the real question is, how can we be sure that that thing, that hunk of new performance, basically, is actually used by people and actually produces results? That, to me, is the nut that implementation planning and change management are trying to crack. So and this point also, sustainment, because if you look, in fact, at least one, if not several of the change management models that we're going to look at briefly, uh, talks about reinforcement as the last section, you know, and I always get a kick out of that word because I was trained as a behavior scientist where reinforcement meant a very specific thing. It meant consequences that increase the likelihood of behavior. But more broadly, as people here, I'm sure know in the management and leadership and training and development world, reinforcement often just means all the stuff you do later to be sure it happens. And that's what I would think of as sustainment. And you can't just kind of throw it in the reinforcement bin. You got to think about what are the factors that will sustain performance over time. So there's a few change management models. And, you know, I just picked a few. You can Google, you can say, what are the, you know, people's favorite change management models? But I think at least one or two of these will be recognizable to everybody. Um, and one of the questions, this is kind of Homer Simpson being a nerd, because this is a little bit of a nerdy way to ask the question. Um, I would say that the typical uh, models are what I would call structural in the sense that they have certain components that they identify that are important, the certain components of interventions. But I come from a background in behavior science and the people that work with me, and we think about events in functional terms. That is, what does this thing, this communication plan, this recognition of people doing the right thing, this tool, this whatever, how does it function to support or improve performance? And so one of the questions to consider as we look at these things is, is that. And there's also another question, which I'm going to use the word systemic. How complete are these things? So here's one. This is, you know, McKinsey is big, <laughs> global. This is their 7S model. And I'm always a little bit um, skeptical of anything that winds up forcing a model into the same letters, especially seven of them. That seems like a very low probability event. But strategy for change. You got to have a strategy. You got to have some structure in the organization that might represent uh, you know, what you're changing to or that will support the change. Um, of course, there are going to be systems and processes. Uh, usually, uh, there may not be changes in values and culture, but often that's a target, actually. Often that's something people are trying to implement or change management toward. You know, for example, these days, typical diversity and inclusion initiatives could be thought of as big time change management efforts if they're successful, or even if they're not, they're efforts. Um, shared values and culture, style of manner work. That to me is just kind of how we do things around here. It's either, it's either the specific sort of technically defined behavior needed to produce whatever somebody's producing, or it might be influenced by the values and culture. Who's involved and what skills are needed. Now, this is a model, but it strikes me that this list is kind of apples and oranges. I'm not struck by its completeness. So again, I'm going to move on real quickly because I'm just using these to make comments, really. The next one is Cotter's change management. And I put in Harvard there only because Cotter was from, from Harvard. And this is a kind of a process that he defines, which is makes a lot of sense. Create a sense of urgency, you know, be, get people to want to need this, whatever it is the change is going to be. Then building build a coalition of people who will help guide it. Then form with those people a strategic vision. Then enlist people to help and then enable them and whoever else is involved by removing roadblocks. Produce some short-term wins, which of course is a consequence for initial implementation. It's a, it's a payoff, really. Sustain that acceleration and institute change over time. This sounds good. Uh, it doesn't help us know what all the things are inside of each of those. Um, but, you know, it's a process and you could flesh this out. And one of the things I believe as I look at these other models is I think the models that we have, the model that we have, which is built around both accomplishments and the six boxes model, I think most of this stuff can be sorted in to the models that we have in a way to identify whether it's complete or not. And then here's the one 
perhaps we've all been waiting for. And we have at least one expert in the group on this, the ADCAR change management approach. And it's an acronym. You know, you've got to establish awareness among people for the need for change. You've got to also establish desire so people want to change. Like, you know, why are we doing this again? And what's the payoff? Um, and then there's probably some knowledge that people need to know about. And you could think of that as the training component. But what do they need to know and know how to do in order to make the change? And then you have to really ensure the skills that they are going to need. And then, again, reinforcement. I'm not sure what that means. It's a big bucket. So this is another one, not a bad sequence of things to take into account. But what I'm struck by is that none of these seem to cover what I would think of as all the bases. I don't think these things take a systemic approach. And so I want to I want to talk a little bit about that, among other things. Um, what I would say is, again, to get a little bit nerdy, is if we're going to improve performance, we will put events into place, conditions into place, what do we call behavior influences that function in certain ways. They set expectations, they provide feedback, they, they enable people by, by, by offering you know, good tools and resources. They, they reinforce in the, in the classic sense, they reward behavior, they provide positive consequences for doing the new s- stuff. They do establish skills and knowledge one way or the other. They select people, especially the people who begin the change or the change agents, the champions, <clears throat> and they need to line up with values. So we need we need a way to think about um, change management or implementation planning, which both establishes explicitly all those functions, all those things that are needed to enable people to behave. And it also needs to be systemic in the sense of complete. Uh, so, so that's at least my my way of thinking about it. Now, the six boxes model, and this may be a little small for many of you to read, depending on what device you're looking at, is definitely systemic. And this is a really old uh, job aid that we use in our programs. But w- what we tried to do here was take these six categories, these six functional categories, which are each defined by what they do to the behavior of people to enable them to produce the accomplishments they need. And this drills down a couple of clicks into um, what the factors are in each of those functions or each of those categories that ought to be in place. So if you're beginning to establish any performance, whether it's an existing one and it's not about change management, it's just being sure people perform well, or especially if you're trying to change performance, you need to take the stuff into account. You need to be sure that as many of these things are in place as you can. So this is what we would think of as a functional and systemic view of all the things you can do to establish behavior that produces results. And then, of course, uh, being in the lineage of Thomas Gilbert and Joe Harless, his protege, we recommend an accomplishment-based approach. Most of the people that I see in this list uh, uh, you know, know about our work and know that where we start when we analyze performance is to look at the valuable products or accomplishments produced by behavior. We're not focused just on behavior. We're, we're mostly start with what is the behavior produce a value? That's what we recommend. Because if you anchor your analysis of performance, and in particular, the changes that are needed to valuable accomplishments, you have a very powerful and clarifying perspective. Because you can say, no, we need a new kind of decisions in place. We need a new teams. We need documents that will be different. We need... Um, uh, recommendations that look different. We need a, an, a process that has a bunch of new milestones in it. In other words, we we need to change the accomplishments or outputs, we call them work outputs, that people produce in some way. And that's the kind of ground of the change. Um, it might also affect the criteria. For example, if we're trying to insert the value of diversity, equity, and inclusion into our organizations, we want to look at specific outputs like decisions, for example, and how would that change what a good hiring decision is, what a good assignment is, what a good funding decision is, et cetera. So we think by being accomplishment-based, we really focus in on what's valuable, and that's really what needs to change. Um, And of course, usually there's also a plan, and that's, you know, you recognize that from the registration page, presumably, or the front uh, front slide of this deck. But, um, you know, usually in some kind of significant rollout uh, or, or implementation or, or um, you know, introducing a new thing, there's usually a bunch of milestones, which is typical. You take a kind of project planning approach. So those are also outputs. 
notice that system up and re- tested and ready to go is an important output in a rollout that depends on that system or um, messages from VP, uh, you know, in the hands of staff people or decisions about X. There's a series of milestones in any significant rollout process that are like milestones in a project plan. So that's where we get what we call the three buckets. And I'm going to come back to this, but I want to just use this as kind of an advanced organizer. What we realized maybe eight, 10 years ago was that if I'm looking at some performance, let's say a new process that I want to implement and I want to be sure it happens and it's a real change thing. First of all, I want to define the performance itself. Like what are the milestones and outputs in this process that we need the target performers, the primary people doing the thing to produce. So that's the first bucket. But when we analyze this, as you'll see, we then recognize, oh, wait a minute. In order for those things to happen, there's other individuals and departments and functions that have to produce things like tools or repeated feedback about the fact that people are doing new thing well or clarifying expectations or they need to be sure the system is up and ready. So there's a bunch of behavior influences on that initial target audience, if you will, the people whose performance has to change, which are as behavior influences, they're products of other people. And so behavior influences on those primary target people may be the outputs of managers, leaders, departments, and so forth. So that's a second bucket. And then the third bucket is the reason that I showed that, uh, that project planning chart, which is that in addition, once we've got all that stuff in place or designed, we're going to roll it out in a series of milestones. And in many contexts, doing that carefully means we need to put things in place to be sure those things happen. So those are our three buckets. And we'll come back to these later, but I just wanted to give you that, as I said, as kind of an advanced organizer. Now, we have a thing called performance improvement logic, and it's very simple. Um, wh- one of the things that it leads me to believe, and the thing that I had as a major insight back when I was working with its team on sales development projects uh, back in the 80s, is that really the implementation planning thing or the change management thing is, is sort of like a second performance project. In other words, we can, we can do analysis of performance. We can figure out exactly what we want people to produce and do. We can define the criteria. We can set up a whole bunch of stuff, design a whole thing for it. But then in order to be sure that happens, we probably need to support or enable the performance of some other folks systemically so that the thing happens. So you could think of this as sort of a second performance, a second layer, if you will, of performance improvement, uh, layered on top of whatever the thing is that we're trying to get people to move toward. So this is our performance improvement logic, and most of the people whose names I see here are familiar with it, but I will go through it uh, step by step. At the beginning of any such project, uh, whether it's a big change management implementation one or many others, you have something, you have a discussion which is about what's at stake here for the organization, maybe for society, but why are we doing this? Often that's embedded in charter documents in some organizations where there's a business case to be made, but why, is this going to improve customer satisfaction or productivity or you know, um, diversity or is it going to improve our bottom line? Is it going to... Um, you know, support regulatory compliance. What's the business result for the whole organization we care about? Once everybody's clear on that, then we say, okay, let's look at the performance. If it's a performance of people who operate a process, or maybe it's performance of every everybody in the organization who meets with other people, or may, maybe it's either bigger or smaller than those, but what are the accomplishments or work outputs that define that performance that to which we'll anchor our analysis. And once we know what those work outputs are, for example, in a process, the milestones in a process, uh, then we say, okay, we sure those contribute to business results. We sure that all these outputs are valuable. And once we've done that, we say, okay, now let's take a look at the behavior. And we, we don't get to the behavior until this point, because up to now, we didn't know what the behavior was supposed to produce. But once you know the work outputs or accomplishments, you can say, oh, this is what we need different people or maybe everyone to do in order to achieve or produce those outputs, those milestones. Once that's pretty well defined, and there may be a bunch of different performers too, of course, remember, it's not just one target role, maybe. Then we say, okay, how are we going to measure it? And one of the things that we know is that business result measures, which often exist, tend to be kind of lagging indicators. So you don't really get a chance 
to uh, make a lot of decisions because you maybe get a data point a quarter or maybe a month per month. Whereas if you're looking at stuff like work outputs, decisions made in a certain way or widgets coming off the assembly line, or as in a case that I was coaching the other day, um, uh, hunks of code that pass tests that don't have to be rewritten. Um, you know, you can measure those things more frequently and their outputs and you can count them. And so that might be a good idea because you can make decisions more frequently. And then behavior, you may be observing behavior in some cases in things like um, um, cultural uh, interventions and some other kinds of interventions. Uh, you may well be paying attention to the behavior because that's part of what you're trying to change. Once you know what you're going to possibly measure, then you go to our six boxes model. And the six boxes model having emerged originally from Skinner's science through Gilbert's behavior engineering model and then through the, our plain English kind of filter is a comprehensive model. And there's really nothing that can affect or influence people's behavior that doesn't fit into one of the cells of that model. And so we use that model now to look at the behavior needed and we say, hmm, what are all the things we have to have in place? And this is where it gets systemic because the six boxes model is a kind of a completeness framework. We can pre be pretty sure we, oh, wait a minute, we forgot about these tools really suck. We forgot to put good ones in. Or, oh, we need to recognize when people do the new thing. It's a very nice completeness framework. And then once we do that, we implement whatever the thing is, and we monitor or measure it. And almost by definition, if we're going to get sustainment, we adjust for continuous improvement. Now, this is what we teach everybody. We teach this in our coaching and leadership and management programs. We teach people in our performance consulting programs and in our uh, HR business partner program and et cetera. This is the core. This is really the logic of what we call performance thinking. So what does that look like? And also in particular, how can leaders and managers contribute? Um, because if you think about it in many, many, many cases, what we're trying to have change are things across groups of employees who are managed and led by others. So this is our old graphic about that. We always, it's a kind of a clunky graphic and it's taken a little bit of heat over the years, but it still works because, and the idea in this context is if you are a leader or a manager or possibly a department like the training department or the IT department, if you're going, if, inf if performance is going to change, you are going to be providing behavior influences that affect the performance of individuals and teams. So you're providing a online tool that better work, or you as a leader are communicating at various levels, expectations for performance, or maybe as a manager supervisor, you're providing frequent feedback about, Oh, that's good that you're doing it the new way. That's great. Or, Possibly if you're in the training department or if you are in charge of a mentoring or a coaching program, you, you're going to be down in the skills and knowledge area and you're going to want to be sure that people have the skills and knowledge they need. So you're going to be essentially delivering tools and resources for them to, to develop those skills and knowledge. Or you're going to be training them. So my point is that others, not just the primary performers, are going to be the people who provide the behavior influences and those are their work outputs. So as I mentioned earlier, this is the second bucket of outputs. Um, and we're back to that, which is that, you know, we've got the thing. We've got the performance that we're trying to change, the new process, uh, the, the outputs that would be produced or affected by the new policy, the whatever it is. We, we define that crisply following that logic that we mentioned. And then in the process, we recognize the need for some behavior influences. And we say, wait a minute, some of these have to be produced by their folks. And if we just sort of say, okay, we hope they do it, that may not work. If this change or thing that we're implementing is really important, we want to lock this down. We want to be sure that the people supposedly producing expectations, feedback, and so forth are actually doing it. So we want to help them, enable them to produce those outputs. And then finally, as I mentioned, there's usually a rollout process with milestones that we can achieve. And those are another set of work outputs. Um, now, this is this uh, I'm going to click this in a moment. Uh, and this is a, a throwback to my days as a PhD student in philosophy. But I was, um, I was brought up in, uh, I was a philosophy major in college, and I was actually in a doctoral program for philosophy in a while before I met B.S. Skinner. And um, I, I used, you know, God, whatever God means to you, in most 
even if you go back to Aristotle and Plato and those guys, uh, and certainly in religious traditions, is sometimes thought of as the uncaused cause, the source of all. Now, this is a little bit of a joke with this little guy up there, but the point is, we need to, if we're going to make this happen, we need to plan it as high into the organization as we can, as we as we need to, really. And so, so I always used to say all the way up to God, which I don't really mean, I, and I don't mean to be uh, uh, sacrilegious, but that's the notion that you can't just stop with the target people and hope it all works. You want to be sure that the folks who are supporting them and the department supporting them are also actually doing what they need to do. Um, so here's an example that may be a little bit hard to read, but I can uh, talk you through it. This actually was from uh, probably my first 10 to 15 years in the performance improvement world when I was focused almost exclusively on sales performance. And we worked with salespeople, usually in major product launches at big banks, at companies like Microsoft and Genentech and other large companies that had existing sales forces. And we had a methodology called the fluency building approach or the, you know, it was fluency based instruction so that people learn stuff. But for a salesperson to actually be able to ask the right questions and respond to objections and comment about this, that and the other thing and talk about customers needs and then talk about how we can address their needs. There's a whole lot of verbal skill and knowledge that needs to be fluent. It can't just be, you know, learn so you can pass the multiple choice test. And so our whole approach was based on building fluent performance on critical um, verbal performance, mostly questions and answers, dialogues, facts that people had to know and so forth. And so in order to do that, we built exercises, activities, some of them written, some of them on cards, some of them using audio tapes, some of them working in pairs. But they were all about practice. They're all about getting not just accurate, but quick, because that's what you need face to face in a sales situation. The challenge was that you couldn't do that in class. You could introduce the material in class. You could have people do reading uh, if you could get them to, and you can set up contingencies, you know, so that if they don't read the reading, if you don't do the reading, they won't look too sharp in class. So you can kind of arrange that. But then the question is when you send them out to the field and they, for this thing to work effectively, they need to practice daily. And they need to, they need to remember to have their class, their materials, their practice materials with them. The first output there, number one, is practice materials in pocket or briefcase when you leave the house or whatever, because you want to pull those suckers out and practice for a few minutes a few times a day. And then when you practice, we want to write down how we did. How many did we get in a minute? You know, how quickly did it? Could we do X, whatever? And ideally, two or three times a day, you want to do that little measurement thing. So um, recorded practice scores were important because that's going to be a basis for feedback from other people. And salespeople being competitive in the way they are, uh, are going to want to show how they did better than the other guy and so forth. And then the third thing is, it might be that um, these people are practicing, but uh, they're not making the progress that they would like or that other people would. Well, maybe they need to work on half the material until they get it right. Maybe they need to practice at a different time of day. Maybe they need to um, do it at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. So there's some decisions, which are outputs, to change uh, how they're practicing that if they're not being successful. And then, of course, ultimately, um, we want sales reps who who meet practice goals. And in some of our examples, uh, one of the one of the bits to this was uh, we would have at some point at like a national sales meeting, we'd have some big competition between the regions. So it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just practicing so I can talk to customers. It was practicing so I can beat the other guy. Anyway, those four outputs, if you will, or accomplishments down the left are critical things that need to be produced and accomplished by the salespeople if this program is going to work. And I will tell you that when it did work, it blew the tops off of anything these people had ever seen before. These young people, often young new salespeople would come out really knowledgeable about um, and fluent about the products, about the competition, about the marketplace, et cetera, which is one of the reasons we got hired pretty often by companies for product launches because they wanted to ramp people up fast. So that's the first bucket. Simple example. Second bucket is in order to get those practice materials in the pocket or briefcase, first of all, there needs to be a practice guide for sales reps. There needs to be some document that describes you know, how to do it and what to do. And that's in green. It sets expectations. It's box one. It's a tool. And it's also a way to develop the skill of how you practice. 
But then managers and leaders also have to set expectations. They have to say, you should practice this daily, you know, and it should come from the VP all the way down to the district manager and it should be clearly expressed and matter of fact. And then probably the daily don't forget prompt in the calendar turns out to be useful too. Uh, when we used to do this, it was before the internet is the way it is now. But we've seen examples where centrally there could be prompts sent out to people's calendars like, that basically don't forget to practice today. Take your stuff with you, you know, and then um, and then sales managers uh, were expected in their weekly check ins to give feedback. Say, hey, that's great the way you're getting really up to speed on that market segment of those products. And and uh, let's talk about that a little bit. And fantastic. Good going, you know, and the materials themselves that we gave people the documents and so forth had to be easy to use that was a tool of course as everybody knows if you got tools that don't work very well people aren't going to use them and then there had to be some kind of incentive for achieving the goals other than oh someday i'll sell better and then there was an arrangement in order to do that of a competition this was my favorite example was at a big biotech company where the sales meeting they divided the it was the com com the country was divided into four regions and there was this giant room where there were questions and prompts up on a big screen and everybody had a little button remote control button and they were all in different teams and the system knew what team you were in and so they were competing for points about who could respond correctly the fastest these guys were up in their chairs you know clicking their buttons you know and so forth so the competition was a big consequence box three and they were highly motivated to meet the other beat the other guys because salespeople kind of like to do that so those are behavior influences that were put in place to be sure that the practice materials were in the pocket or briefcase. And frankly, also that the, they recorded their practice scores, the second output there, but we had to add a couple things. We had to give them a goal. Like you should be able to finish this card set within a minute and a half, or you should be able to get through all these items, looking them up and da, 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 whatever. Um, and give them a really easy to use user tested recording tool. So it would be not a problem. These days it would probably be on your phone or your iPad. And then again, we needed to have a manager in place who asked uh, in order to get that to happen. Like, how are you doing? Let me see your scores. And then the decisions to make changes, you had to add to that the practice guide, which had very good directions and decision tables about stuff you could try if you weren't making pro progress. It had a recording sheet in it that was easy to use. Uh, the practice goals, um, uh, you know, if you if you made progress, it was, and because you made a good change, you, you said, oh, I think I'm just going to practice for half minutes instead of a minute. And you started to see your performance get better. That's a natural consequence. And then, of course, we wanted to encourage all the team members to, you know, have all their buddies uh, getting good at this stuff, which was one reason we, um, in some cases, divided them into regions or districts so they'd compete. Uh, to drive team collaboration. And then the sales reps who meet the practice goals, of course, all those things that are listed as behavior influences. But in the end, the region that won the competition was the big consequence. And of course, ultimately, the big consequence is selling more stuff, but that's not going to happen for a little while. So that's bucket two. Those are all behavior influences, but consider the fact that those are outputs of teams or individuals or the managers. So then this, the, so, so in order to make that happen, we, uh, one of the things that the first thing you'll see in that column says cheat sheets for sales managers. Um, one of the things you will see there is that um, um, we, we, we had sales managers who did not go through the, the training program. And uh, um, so they, they were kind of a little bit uptight. They didn't want to look stupid in front of their sales reps every Friday when they checked in with them. So just leaving it the way it was, they probably wouldn't even bring up like, how's that thing in the new product going? And they wouldn't ask them questions about it because they didn't want to look stupid. So we realized that was an issue. And so we said, we're going to create some little cheat sheets that have like five or six important topics with about a page of background on it. So the sales manager sort of knows something about this, the new market segment or whatever it is. And then we'll have a couple of starter questions. And if you're in your phone conversation with the rep, and you just get that going, you'll look like you knew something and it will be a big deal. And then the sales rep will kind of take over. So that cheat, those cheat sheets made a big uh, difference in the willingness and ability of the managers to actually set expectations, provide feedback. Of course, the VP delivered a mess the message to the managers. So, you know, I'd like you to do this, guys. And then there were also some champions, some sort of 
you know, leading edge people who are really into it. And they sort of spread the message around their, their clients. This is part of what change management folks would probably think of as a communication plan. And then the IT department sent out these automatic calendar prompts to don't forget to take your stuff and practice. And managers ask about the practice guide, if people are using it, if they found it useful. And then sales operations arranged for this incentive, you know, kind of uh, payoff for beating the other guys. So you can go down that. But the point is, we are arranging in that third column behavior influences to be sure that the behavior influences happen. So that's the all the way up to God part. And we could drill into this. This is a really simple example. But the point is we want to lock this thing down so we are sure that the interventions that we planned actually happen. And those interventions or components of them are often the products of other people's behavior. And that's probably the biggest insight in here and why we call it the three buckets thing. And then, of course, the third bucket is the rollout plan, like stuff ready to go, materials in the hands of the uh, of, of the sales representatives, um, you know, um, sales representatives who can, who can demonstrate during classroom setting that they can use the materials properly and so forth. So that's a set of milestones that are about how to roll it out. And that's the third bucket that we want to be sure happens. Now, we can do all of that. But almost guaranteed, as Gina Rester, Zadro, and her colleagues from Amgen showed us years ago, we need to be explicit about sustainment. So um, I want to show you step by step sort of what we think of as the steps in doing this. I mean, before we get to sustainment, first of all, as we said with the performance improvement logic, be sure we know what's at stake here and that everybody's clear. This is so we can generate greater sales revenue or this is so we are a more attractive company to diverse uh, populations or whatever the business results are that we're trying to go after. And then we say, OK, what are the important outputs in that? decisions, widgets, documents, relationships, et cetera. And that's, those are the outputs or the accomplishments that define the thing we're trying to put in place, the thing we're trying to change to or implement. And then with each of those outputs, we say, okay, what does a good look like? What are criteria for each of these things for a good hiring decision, for a good document, you know, plan, a good budget, a good relationship, et cetera. So we know what good looks like. So it's possible to get crisp about measurement, feedback, and so forth. And then we say, let's take a look and see if there's some best practices behavior that would produce those outputs. And this is just part of what we always recommend in performance consulting and performance analysis anyway. Let's take a look. Are there some really specific behavior we want to put in place um, or recommend to people to produce these outputs? And then let's take a look using the six boxes to be sure we've got the behavior influences most likely to support that new performance, that behavior that produces the valuable outputs. And then step back, and this is where we get to box two and say, wait a minute, the managers and supervisors have to produce expectations and feedback. IT department has to be sure this stuff is on, online. The tech support people have to be sure that they have solutions to problems if the, if the performers are running into them. In other words, we want to be sure that the behavior influences needed to support the original target population are happening. And so we list those as outputs or accomplishments. And we define, uh, you know, we, we, those are both behavior influences of the target uh, population and they're the outputs of some people. And so we then uh, also arrange behavior influences to, to be sure the rollout happens. And that's the third bucket. And then this is the sustainment part. And this is the thing that Gina and her colleagues taught us about, which is that and a lot of people do this routinely, but not everybody does. A lot of times hidden in that word reinforcement is put some stuff in place and then we're on to the next project. But the key concept is if you are implementing something new or if you're doing change management, at some point, maybe six weeks later, eight weeks later, whatever seems like a reasonable time frame so that the conditions you put in place are, ought to be taking hold, you go back and check and you do a quick and dirty six boxes analysis to see what you missed. Because I guarantee you'll always miss stuff, as probably everybody in this group knows. We never, we don't usually get it perfectly right. And one of the problems with a lot of interventions is that people just bake them and then send them off, as opposed to going back and saying, oh, wait a minute, we didn't realize that people were going to prefer to use their pencils instead of the online thing. That's, we, we should need to fix that, or whatever it is. So that's the sustainment part to, it's essentially agile. It's going back and saying, 
okay, what do we miss? What can we improve and re revise? So that's kind of the end of what I have to say. Uh, you know, there's a lot more resources in our resource library and performance thinking. There's a lot of more stuff on our YouTube channel at performancethinking.tv. Uh, our next open virtual practitioner program, the current one is filled. It's starting next week, actually. But the next open one is in January. So if anybody's interested in our performance consulting certification program, that's you can find out about it on the website. And our colleague Shane Isley is going to be delivering an open virtual coaching program uh, starting in a few weeks, actually, for people in the applied behavior analysis, behavioral health world. So that's worth checking out. So here, just to come full circle are some takeaways and I'd like to emphasize them and I want to see what you guys think uh, in the in the chat box um, first thing is the way at least I define change management and implementation planning is it's about establishing and sustaining performance that is new in some way it, there's lots of dimensions of that but somehow it's a new thing we're trying to change to or implement um, now what I think and I want to highlight this because when I went over those change management models I, I did not intend to diss the people or the models what I believe is that people that have been involved in implementation planning and change management as an area of specialty have devised some beautiful best practices they know how to create in many cases great communication plans they know how to identify champions and change agents there's a bunch of pieces of, of, of what those folks have discovered that are powerful and we ought to incorporate them. And there's no reason why we can't it. They will fit into the six boxes someplace. A lot of them tend to be box one things like champions and, and, uh, and change agents tend to set expectations for people. They tend to model things. They tend to provide feedback, um, et cetera. So you can usually sort the functions served by the different interventions in these change management methodologies into the six boxes. The problem with I, that I see with these models, and maybe I'm just being too narrow minded, is that the models seem to be lists of interventions. They seem to be sort of structural. They're not really functional systems. And so what we think that this approach can bring to the table is a more complete, we won't miss the variables that really make a difference approach. So uh, we think we can integrate those best practices that the practitioners of different change management methodologies have into the six boxes model framework in a way that provides a very systemic, effective approach that doesn't miss any, uh, doesn't miss stuff. Um, and then we can, we can apply performance improvement logic to develop sustainable interventions by sort of incorporating that loop at the end where we check and we revise. Um, and then really bottom line is, uh, I, I, I think I, I put the word just in quotation marks because just doesn't mean small. But we can approach change management or implementation planning, it seems to me, as a performance improvement project. We can apply everything we know about establishing and developing and accelerating performance in the more general case to implementation planning and change management. So that's what I have to say. Uh, let me just leave this up here and uh, hope that people are still with us. Uh, I wonder what you think or if you have any questions or comments. And please use the chat box. So I answered. So Ian, uh, your question, it looks like, was about what the three buckets meant. Uh, they're the three buckets of accomplishments. Yeah, they're actually, Ian, they're, they're the, let me be clear about that. The, um, the, their behavior influences that are the products of other people. So the three buckets are all accomplishments. They're all work outputs, if you will. They're things that people have to produce. The first bucket is the stuff that the performers that are going through the change have to produce. The second bucket are behavior influences on those first groups that some other people are responsible for. Like, um, uh, you know, some other people were responsible for providing feedback, setting expectations, reminding people to do this, uh, getting the the the, the in getting them the uh, notices into IT, the IT calendar system, et cetera, et cetera. And then the third set of outputs are milestones. So there are really three buckets of outputs. It just happens to be that the second bucket are behavior influences produced by people to influence the first group. Is that is that clear, Ian? Are you still with us? I'm looking at your other question too. Or your other comment, which is um, 
would behavior influences on those responsible for delivering on the milestones be be part of bucket two or a fourth bucket? Uh, would behavior influences on those responsible for delivering on the milestones? I think they could be any number of things. In other words, uh, if we're mo- if we're doing things like being sure stuff is in place, we definitely need to have expectations in place about, for example, what it means for everybody to be ready to go or for the system uh, uh, of a bucket two or a fourth bucket. Behavior influences on those responsible for delivering on the milestones. Oh, well, good point. Okay, I, I get it. Yeah, that's the all the way up to God part. In other words, if we've got a third bucket of... of uh, um, outputs, you could sort of say, you, yeah, you could say it's a four bucket approach. Probably you could probably say that there are people responsible for being sure that the implementation thing happens. And so they put things in place. Uh, it's fair enough. Yeah, that works. Anybody else? Scott, you know more about change management than I probably ever will. What do you think about this? Any thoughts? All righty. Well. Oh, so Don. Yeah, I I agree with you, Don. I think I came into it sort of naively. If you guys are looking at the chat box, you can see Don, uh, Don's comment. He says, I love this, Carl, and relate to it immediately. I like to think of this as built-in performance enablement. People who haven't been systemic can relate. Uh, it's the system. Having done some similar things, similar uh, things of this, et cetera. So, yeah, I think that um, it's – I kind of fell into it. And, and it wasn't until a few years later when I said, wait a minute, a lot of these performance things that I'm doing are basically about implementing new stuff. So it was, it was kind of a duh moment for me. So you think it works, Scott. You know, wh- one, of the, one of the exercises that I've not gone through that would be kind of fun to do with somebody like you who really knows the change management stuff well. Um, and we did this with lean process improvement many years ago, uh, which is to take all the interventions, all the variables, all the components of any given change management intervent- approach, you know, change, man- like what are the, what do the change agents do? What do the champions do? How do they sort into their functions in the six boxes and basically, and, you know, communication plans and so forth. It'd be really interesting, I think to sort of say, okay, let's take these change management methodologies, sort their components into the six boxes and see if there's anything missing or seeing if it helps us see things more clearly in some way. Anyone else? Any other comments? Scott? Yeah. Okay. Good comment, Scott. I'm I'm, I'm repeating this because I realized in the recordings that the chat box doesn't come through, but Scott Mills, who's a, used to be a consultant in this area. Um, he says the other models seem to push the change, make them love uh, what they hate, or at least want to do it. With performance thinking, we reconfigure consequences to build the change along. And we, and it's not just consequences, Scott. That's the thing. You know, one of the things I've learned over quite a few years with this whole performance thinking thing is that a lot of people talk about consequences as being, you know, what motivates people. And so you have brilliant, thought leaders like Aubrey Daniels and others who think about how do we use positive reinforcement? And that's a great thing. But for example, if we give people a tool or a process or a job aid or a form, it's way easier to use than some other clunky one that they might've encountered. It's, it's easier for them to do the thing to make contact with the natural payoff of whatever it is. So especially in areas like process improvement, you know, or processes where you look at processes and you say, well, there's a bunch of new stuff you got here. And it's going to be kind of hard in the beginning. You want to really enable people to be able to get through the process enough times successfully and say, yeah, that's a good one, you know, and here's some correction and stuff so that they actually make contact with the natural payoff of producing whatever it is they were supposed to at the end of it, like a great PowerPoint presentation or a budget or a, you know, treatment plan or something like that. And so I tend to think that, it is bigger than just configuring the consequences. I think it's 
enabling people to achieve the natural consequences, if necessary, maybe with some extrinsic ones like, you know, competitive salespeople competing to win the, the you know, <laughs> experience or something. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is enable people to be successful, which means produce the natural payoff of whatever it is that they're doing. And so I think if we take a systemic approach, if we use the six boxes model to be sure we haven't missed stuff, it makes it more likely because I'm sure everybody here has been involved in something where they got all excited about whatever. And then they, they get, they have to use this new system, which everybody thought was cool and the marketing looked great, but it's a pain. Oh, geez, you know, or, or there's people who have to do stuff and they kind of have to figure it out because the instruction manual sucks. And so then people say, well, oh, wait a minute, we'll make you some really nice job aids for the critical stuff. So it's a lot easier to do this. Um, so I think that's an important piece. It's, it's enabling. Okay. Well, I don't want to keep anybody any longer than, uh, we need, but, uh, appreciate your comments. Any last uh, comments or thoughts about this? A lot of the projects that I've coached in, uh, in our practitioner program actually do amount to this kind of a thing in the end. Sometimes we don't go so far as to really flesh out the second bucket probably as deeply as we should. But if change is critical, it's important. Yeah, I agree, Don. I think uh, Don says the lack of the use of approaches like this in business and industry, and particularly this session today, reveal that business industry overall is underdeveloped in terms of potential. Well, that's true. And just to jump from that to Tom Gilbert, you know, Tom used to talk about the potential for improving performance, or we call it the upside potential. But I think in many, many areas, it's just like in training, that that self-paced fluency building model that we used with salespeople for years, or even better, when we applied that in call centers, like we have a publication actually on our website about work that we did at at t Wireless. And we were, enable, we were able to enable new customer service reps at at t Wireless who used to take two months to get to a certain benchmark of calls handled, productivity, and so forth. We were able to reduce it to two weeks. And not only that, but they kept on going and got 60% more productive than people had been before. So when you, when you see those kind of results, you say, oh, my gosh, there's a huge upside potential for improvement.